thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, in the interest of disclosure, uh, I would like to mention to everyone present here that Nestle is on a silent period because of their quarterly results coming up. So we can't talk about anything that's happening right now. But we have a company that talks about good food, good life. So we don't have to talk about anything that's happening right now. There's so much more. Uh, you know, to start with, like sh when she was introducing the company, she spoke of being an iconic brand. Like iconic, legendary, these are heavy words. So when your brand falls in the category of being iconic, does that come with a lot of responsibility? I'm sure it does. So how do you live up to that image every day across the array of products that you have across markets? How is that balancing happening? Well, thank you, Tasme, for this question. And like you said, you know, Nestle is a 150-year-old company. So, of course, it has a very strong legacy, a portfolio of different products, of different brands across uh, different sort of, you know, consumer needs, consumer occasions, different product categories, and so on. So, of course, to keep that all alive, it's very, very important that we look at the starting point, which is essentially the purpose of each of the brands. And in order to keep, you know, such a strong legacy and also keep evolving with the changing times, you have to go back to what does the brand really stand for? And what are the kind of consumer experiences, brand experiences that we want to build around the brand? And how do we keep changing with the times without losing the essence of the brand? Right. And that is what we have been essentially doing across our different brands whether it's Nescafe, whether it's Maggie, whether it's KitKat, or any of the other brands around the world as well. Staying true to the purpose, to what the brand stands for, ensure that we evolve with the times, ensure that we also kind of, you know, uh, don't, don't fall into any kind of a trap of just buzzy little things happening without having a very clear direction or idea of where we want to go and where Absolutely. we want to really move forward with. So that's been our, you know, sort of, sort of way in which we build brands. If you look at KitKat, for example, you know, KitKat always stands for a break. Have a break, have a KitKat. Now, breaks are very important to people's Absolutely. lives. You know, if you don't take breaks, and in today's busy and fast lives, people have to take breaks. They should take breaks. Breaks are good for them, you know, so that they can come back more rejuvenated. They can come back better and so on. It's that philosophy. Now, you could maybe, you know, have a, some of those breaks with KitKat, which can help you enjoy. There are ways of taking breaks and various kinds of, you know, products and services which could help you take breaks better. And KitKat is one of them which, you know, you could use. And of course, you could use many more. So taking a break is very important. And ensuring that our breaks keep up with the changing times with different consumers is also very, very important. So that's how we go ahead with what we do. If you look at a brand like Nescafe, you know, today a country like India has a lot of tea drinking population. So therefore, in order to kind of get people more and more interested in coffee and to increase penetration of coffee. Nescafe has been trying to target the youth and trying to say how coffee as a partner could help you feel more stimulated, to help you feel more energized, to help you improve the pace of your life. So therefore, there is a role of our brands and our products in people's lives. If you don't find that role of our brands and products in people's lives, then those kind of propositions would be short-lived. And, and therefore, you know, our brands and products, because they find a role over a period of time, they tend to continue over generations while also changing along with the times. Sure. You know, uh, Chandana picked up a lot of keywords from there. You spoke about purpose. You spoke about changing over times. And that is where sustainability also comes in, right? And Nestle as a, as a brand has made significant strides towards sustainability. So it would be great to understand how you embed sustainability in your brand and that goes beyond marketing campaigns. How do you make it a part of the brand ethos in the everyday operations that you have back at your company? Well, you know, right embedded in our purpose is the entire notion of enabling happier and healthier lives. And we look at not just happier and healthier lives for people, we also look at how do we steward resources for future generations how do we care about the planet? How do we care about the communities that we live in? Right. Because embedded in our purpose is the belief that our future generation should have a stronger and richer kind of life compared to what the current generation has. And therefore, we have to be more sustainable about the future. I think it's 
with all the climate change, with all the different, you know, carbon and various other issues, it's very, very important that we embrace all of that. And that's what our endeavor has been to kind of embed sustainability and not just, you know, embed sustainability in, in word, but more importantly, in spirit. Mm -hmm. So if you look at, you know, some of the work that we do in our, with our dairy farmers, for example, you know, it's all about what work we do about with the dairy farmers. That's where sustainability comes in. Mm -hmm. That's where we try and, you know, get things around biomass boilers, around different elements of our sustainability. If you look at the work that we do with our coffee farmers, for example, in trying to improve some of the agricultural practices in the way coffee is grown and farmed and, and the agronomists that work together with coffee farmers to have more sustainable crops for the future, how do we look at, you know, more broadly regenerative agriculture, which is, of course, a, a journey. Sure. It's not something that is going to suddenly happen. But, you know, our North Star is very, very clear that we want to move into a more and more sustainable place. We also try and do small little things with what we can do in terms of having more specific sustainable initiatives. But at the backbone is trying to get an ecosystem which is more sustainable by itself. So where the food comes from, what kind of packaging is used, and we know, you know, all the issues around plastics and so on and yes, so forth. So we're course. increasingly trying to, you know, handle those issues and move forward and, and, and so on. And we are trying to increasingly also pay more attention to some of these sustainable practices, whether it's energy, whether it's farming or agriculture. And that's really the core of our stuff. You know, it's not about just communicating it. We first believe that we would like to do the things and get the elements in place and ensure that we have a certain scale and we have a certain way of doing things, you know, across the organization, and then we could communicate with consumers in the right way. But what's very important is to have the authenticity at the core, is to have those practices at the core, and that is far more important for us than anything else. Perfect. And you know, when you say talking to customers, uh, consumer preferences are evolving, changing, right? And there is a whole set of generation and a whole set of people who believe in a healthy life, switching on to healthier options. Uh, in a time like that, how do you innovate on products? And if you can give us some examples where you know the product strategy has aligned with these trends. Well, so with, with the changing consumer of today in you know, all different aspects, you know, you look at newer generations coming in, there's Gen, uh, Gen Z and then of course Gen Alpha. And then the kids who are being born right now are Baby called Gen... Baby boomers, yeah, I think. <laughs> they're called Gen Gamma and so yes, on. So yes. therefore, you know, they're always these newer and younger generations mm -hmm. coming in all the time. So I think it's important that we understand their needs, understand their values, understand their mindsets, understand what they're looking at, you know, and understand, you know, what really shapes from the external environment, mm -hmm. what really shapes their way of thinking and their way of looking at things, what shapes their identity, what are the causes that they care about? What elements do they really kind of look at and so on? And of course, on the product side, you know, there are, there's a lot more experimentation in food, for example. You know, people are getting much more conscious about their health, their diet, their wellness, which is, I think, a very, very useful thing. I mean, people should get more conscious about their health and diets and so on and so forth. And, and, and that's how people are moving in that direction. Taste continues to be very, very fundamentally important in food because, you know, in food you wouldn't just consume something if it doesn't have a certain amount of taste appeal and, and therefore sure. taste appeal is very, very important. So looking at all these different dimensions, you know, we, we look around in social media, we look around at what's happening in the external environment, we use a lot of AI and other things to understand, you know, what kind of trends are emerging what kind of trends are also gaining certain amount of momentum, what trends are kind of a little more stagnant. And based on that and more, more fundamental consumer research and various other aspects as well, we try and see what's the most relevant in terms of our, our consumer needs of today. So just to give you a couple of examples, and Maggie, for, for example, you know, recently we launched the, or not so recently actually, a year, year and a half back, we launched Maggie Korean noodles. We do find the younger generations getting more and more interested in the, with the Korean wave, you know, with the Korean taste and, and various elements around Korean. It's not just taste, it's also a certain way of living and a certain, you know, culture and a certain, you know, larger aura around it. So we launched Maggie Korean noodles. Now it's a much more spicier noodle. It's a very specific 
kind of a taste. Uh, and yes, you know, younger generations are very, very attracted to that kind of taste. We've seen the K-pop revolution and so on and so forth. So it's also important to identify those a little bit, uh, sometimes ahead of time, sometimes in time. Uh, but sometimes we also go on it a little later in time, depending on, you know, how we prioritize these things. But very important to stay in tune with the trends, and that's one, you know, innovation that we have launched some time back. Uh, another one, you know, as an example, uh, is Maggie uh, oats and millet noodles. Mm -hmm. So the people, you know, who are getting more and more conscious about their health and so on, and therefore it's important to look at, you know, healthier grains and healthier ingredients playing a part in, in people's lives and so on. And it's also important to understand that, you know, you can't just have oats and millets, you also need to have the right taste and the yes. right, you know, other elements around it so that people come back to it and keep eating it. So therefore, we, we have sort of, you know, launched those kind of products as well to appeal to that health conscious kind of a, kind of a segment. If you just move a little bit into coffee, then, you know, we have something called Nescafe Black Roast, which yes. is a stronger coffee. You know, there are people who are getting much more interested in coffee. Uh, and it's good to see that interest kind of, you know, coming in over a period of time. People are not just looking at regular mainstream coffee, but also, you know, more specific blends, more specific tastes, stronger coffees. Mm -hmm. They make coffees in different ways, you know, like during COVID and a little bit later, we had Dalgona coffee, if you remember, oh, yes. that was a big oh, yes. buzz on, on social Banana media. Banana breads and Dalgona coffees. Yeah, absolutely. Been to that. Yes. So, so I think these are all interesting, newer ways of consumption and always, you know, keeps things on. So therefore, we've launched certain, certain, those kind of things, you know, which appeal to that kind of a consumer and meets those kind of needs. So it's an ongoing, you know, process for, for fast-moving consumer goods, and we pretty much try and see how we can bring in the most relevant products to the consumer. Right. Uh, before I move on to the two fun questions I have, uh, one last piece of serious question is, uh, we spoke so much about uh, Maggie, and we have a communication leader amongst us. So it would be um, very interesting to learn, you know, the Maggie incident we had, and again, Maggie is, was in no time back to being the market leaders, being the con uh, consumer favorite. So what are the key learnings that happened during that time and the importance of crisis management? If you can talk a little bit about that. So I think fundamentally for any brand, a brand is built on trust mm -hmm. and a brand exists because of the trust it enjoys with consumers, with sure. people, with stakeholders, you know, all different kinds of stakeholders and everyone else. Mm -hmm. So it's very, very important that that trust is built and that trust is nurtured over a period of time. And for a brand like Maggie, you know, we have built that trust, we have nurtured that trust over a very long period of time. So therefore, you know, and, and we have all the elements which sort of, you know, contribute to that reputation, to that familiarity, to that favorability, to that trust. And that's something that we constantly look at and we constantly see that that's something that does not move away. And that is one of the elements, you know, which sort of helped. And it helps, you know, any any organization brand going through a period of crisis or to handle a crisis that trust is at the core and if you lack trust in any case you know then it's something that goes against you so luckily we had the trust you know always and we had trust as a big kind of an element which worked very well for us and that's the most fundamental way of kind of you know looking at uh, looking at things the second very important element is to always be very very transparent and we were very transparent Right. You know, right from the beginning on what it is and so on and so forth, to be proactively transparent in handling the situation, to reach out to people, to reach out to everyone and see, you know, what exactly is the situation and what, how fast we move, how, how much agility we bring in, how we really take stock of the situation, to be humble, but yet, you know, be bold and be really confident because you've earned the trust and you've got the trust. So therefore... Right. You know, you should use all these elements in the right way to be able to work and move very, very fast. And, you know, there are various kinds of crises that brands go through over a period of time, and, and therefore they need to have their backbone of trust very, very clear. And, and of course, you know, work through it, and that is what helped us uh, to sort of, you know, move over and tide over the crisis. And being a brand which people love so much, loved so much and continue to love so much, you know, we came back uh, 
and uh, you know we came back with a campaign saying we miss you and and consumers said we missed you too and and therefore you know that's how we came back Okay, moving on to the fun light on a lighter note. While this is pegged as a fun question, it's a very serious business question. This business secret kind of question. There is a phenomena and a trending hashtag Pahado Wali Maggi. We all want to know what's the secret. Is there any secret to why that is so much more tastier than the other Maggis that we have? Well, Maggi is something which you can make in many, many different ways. Right. Yeah, there are so many recipes available, you know, consumer user generated content and recipes and so on and so forth. So there are like a zillion ways of making Maggie. And you know, usually in the hills, which is the Pajaro and, and, and so on. I mean, Maggie has been so much a part of people's life and there are nice recipes which people have kind of, you know, built in and made and prepared and these small little shops have kind of innovated and developed their own recipes and they bring it to consumers. And given that the temperatures are a little down, you know, sometimes it's one of the more convenient things that you can get in every nook and corner in the, in the hills and so on. And, and that's how it makes the right kind of setting, the right kind of mood, the right kind of product experience and everything else to come in together. And that's how Paharo Wali Maggi is so interesting. Right. So now we you know, know you're not concept. doing anything at the back end. Well, yeah, it's <laughs> something that has come out from consumers and, and that's how we continue to, so of course, you know, nurture that because today a lot of what you do as a brand, actually consumers also own a part of it. I mean, sure. consumers do things and they're very much part of what the brand is. You have to live with it. Right. It's not that, you know, it's just a one-way communication that as a brand you're doing this. Uh, big brands, consumers have a way and, and the way they interpret it, the way they, you know, have a role in their lives, the way they kind of use it and the various segues and other things that they do along with the brand. So that then becomes a part of the wider wider ethos and the wider ecosystem in which a brand lives. And that's something which marketeers have to accept. And it's not just a one-way traffic that I just stand and believe in this and that's it. No, a part of that is actually uh, consumers and, and strong brands have that. Right. And actually, you know, strong brands are lucky enough to have that because that is where, you know, consumers also feel, feel a certain amount of attachment to the brand and they find a role for the brand. That's where they keep going back to the brand and consuming it at whatever you know, level in their lives. Right. Last question, uh, talking of going back to the brand, Maggie has so, uh, sorry, Nestle has so many brands. What is your favorite and why is it your favorite? Is it Maggie? Is it something else? We'd love to know. Well, actually, I don't have a favorite within the Nestle portfolio. Uh, you know, I sort of have different products at different points in time and different occasions and so on. You know, could often start my day with a with a Nestle A plus milk, you know, um, and so on. Of course, there's A plus dahi as well, which can come in later in the day. And then, of course, Nescafe is a very important part. Now, more importantly, Nescafe Gold is a very important part of my life. And then, occasionally, I do, of course, you know, have a have a Kit Kat and have a break, and and I could snack on something else as well. And uh, uh, and Maggie's there, you know, from time to time, of course. So I think it's important to have a galaxy that's of different... That's a lot different. of endorsement <laughs> in one sentence, but well, yes. That's a, it's a galaxy of different products Absolutely. that could find a way in each person's life over a period of time. Thank you. Thank you so much. We're running out of time. Thank you so much for this conversation. Thank you, Tasmeet. Thank, Thank you. you.